Good evening, everyone. I'm Council Member Monique Anderson Walker, and I want to thank you for joining us tonight. We recognize that you could have chosen to spend your evening doing any other, any number of things. And so we appreciate the time and attention you're giving to the discussion of African Americans and people of color who silently go missing. As we approach the end of Black History Month, I felt compelled to shine light on the topic of Black and missing, as this is a grossly underserved issue that will not go away at midnight on the 28th. People of color are experiencing daily biases that are literally costing them their lives, yet those stories, our stories, are not headlining the daily news cycles or social media feeds. Last year, our world went through a second pandemic of ongoing racial injustices. Yet as painful as it was, I felt empowered when the crowds of protesters would shout, say their names. This evening, we will meet victims that are often entrapped and, and even forgotten simply because of the color of their skin. Our presenters this evening will provide, will provide facts uh, that may overwhelm you but our goal is not to shock you, rather to open your eyes so that we can promote changes that will make these distressful events rare, if not non-existent. If you have questions or comments, feel free to type them into the chat at any time, and we will address them in our Q&A segment at the end of the presentations. At this time, allow me to introduce our first presenters. They are co-founders of the Black and Missing Foundation, Derricka Wilson and Natalie Wilson. Making a difference in her community, and I'm speaking of Derricka Wilson, making a difference in her community is what keeps Derricka Wilson, co-founder of Black and Missing Foundation Incorporated, passionate and driven to succeed. Recognized for her achievements uh, in helping those in need, Derricka has been featured on The View, Essence, People, Good Morning America, and CNN for her outstanding public work, service work. She started her law enforcement career with the Arlington County Sheriff's Department in Virginia where she served as a deputy sheriff, recruiter, and test administrator. She later became the first African-American female officer with the City of Falls Church Police Department as a patrol officer and teaching public safety programs at schools. She also, she also served as a recruiter, test administrator, and background investi investigator with the agency. It was during this time when she found her calling in helping those in need. So she co-founded the national nonprofit Black and Missing Foundation Incorporated, an organization that helps raise awareness for missing persons of color. Derricka's broad experience, integrity, and a diligent work ethic has served her well throughout her career. A native of Spartanburg, South Carolina, Derricka graduated from Northern Virginia Criminal Justice Training Academy. She is also a member of the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives. She is happily married and has two children. She, along with Natalie Wilson, with more than 15 years of experience in public relations and marketing, Natalie is one of the co-founders of Black and Missing Foundation. She is also the founder and CEO of NWR Communications Group. Natalie is an award-winning practitioner in the fields of nonprofit development, communications, marketing, media relations, digital media, and crisis management. That's a lot. Uh, she holds a Master's of Arts, Master of Arts degree in communications from Trinity University and a Bachelor of Arts in Psychology from Howard University in Washington, DC, where she resides with her family. Both Derricka and Natalie were awarded the BET Network's Black Girls Rock Community Change Agent Award. Welcome Derricka and Natalie. Good afternoon or good evening. Thank you. Good evening. Look, thank you for, for being with us and sharing um, coming here to share information. Well, tell us a little bit about why you started this organization and, and why do you think it was even necessary to start it? Sure, so this is Natalie, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, in 2004, there was a young lady by the name of Tamika Houston and she vanished from Derricka's hometown of Spartanburg, South Carolina. And Derricka and I learned how her family really struggled to get media coverage particularly national media coverage around her disappearance. And a year later, Natalie Holloway disappeared and we all know her name and she dominated the news. So we began to do some research and we had no idea 
how lopsided the numbers really were as they bring to missing Americans. Most aren't young, they're not attractive, they're not white women. In fact, most were men, black men, and 30% were people of color. And they attracted almost no national news coverage. So Derek and I decided to do something about it. Um, my background is in PR and thank you for mentioning that. And Derek is, is in law enforcement. And those, those are the critical fields needed to bring awareness and to help us find us. And at the time we said, if we can just find one person and bring them home, we would be successful. But that number continues to grow and it's now at 40%. So 40% of all persons missing are of color. And we keep going because for many of these families, we are their last resort. We are their only hope. So we are doing all that we can to bring awareness to this silent crisis or this pandemic that's affecting our communities. And again, thank you so much for using your platform and, and just bringing this to the forefront. So, you know, I was moved when you said, say their names with everything that happened during this pandemic and the racial inequality. So that's what we wanna do. We wanna say their names. We want the community to know who's missing. So we're gonna show a few faces of our missing in the community. You know, we have Relisha Rudd. She's been missing from Washington, D.C. since March 2014. We have Christian Muse. He's been missing from Maryland, Fort Washington since July 2012. Terrence Wood Jr., missing since 2018 from Maryland. Briasia Terrell, she's been missing since July 2020, Iowa. Ariana Fitz, she's been missing since February 2016 from California. Carol Carter, she's been missing from Prince George's County since August 2020. Devontae Morgan, he's been missing from California since May 2020. Kiara Coles, Keisha Jacobs, Akil Eggleston. And we want our community to know that these individuals are missing, but there are so many more. This is just scratching the surface you know, of those that are missing in our community. And oftentimes people wanna know, well, why are our people going missing? And as Derica mentioned, the people or the profiles that she just showed is just scratching this surface. There are hundreds of thousands of people of color missing from around the country. And persons of color are, remit, are reported missing for a number of reasons such as mental health issues, hmm. domestic violence, abductions, sex trafficking, and the sad fact that law enforcement and the media, they take some of these cases less seriously than others, especially our kids that are classified as a runaway. You know, missing persons is, is not a black issue or a white issue, it is an American issue. And we all have a responsibility law enforcement, the media, and more importantly, the community. We want to show you how that all plays a factor in finding our missing. Some of you may have heard of this situation that just occurred about two weeks ago, where this 10-year-old girl, she was abducted, and the sanitation workers happened to see the news alert, located the car, and rescued this 10-year-old little girl who was abducted. Last summer, 39 missing children who were victims of human trafficking, they were rescued out of Georgia. The FBI rescued 33 children that were uh, in human trafficking out of South, South, I'm sorry, Southern California. And more recently, we had 179 arrested in Ohio for human trafficking and all these things that are going on because this is a pandemic that's happening. And it's so important for people to understand that this is happening on US soil. People think that's always happening abroad, but it's happening right here in our own backyards. So in intense early media coverage, it ensures that our community is looking for the missing individual 
and it increases the chance of a recovery. And media attention also forces law enforcement to add resources to the case. But one of the things Derek and I have been saying for quite a while is that media coverage should be equal across yeah. the board. And our goal is to saturate the local and national media markets so that our missing can household names as well. You all have heard of John Benet Ramsey, Lacey mm -hmm. Peterson, Lee Holloway. What about the others that remain missing? Like Jesse Shockley, Akia Eggleston. Now Felicia Barnes, she her body has been found, but it's so uncommon in our communities for anyone to name maybe three to four black girls or women who have recently made headlines for going missing. And it's a sad, you know, reality in our communities. And there's something called the missing white woman syndrome. And if you're a missing white woman, blonde hair and blue eyes, the media tend to gravitate to those stories because mm -hmm. it sounds good, it's the news out ratings. Um, but we need to, you know, do away with that stereotype with the missing white woman syndrome and feature more of everyone. We say less of one person and more of everyone else will greater the chance for recovery. And I mentioned before, we can't wait for the news cycle. Time is of the essence. A person can go missing from DC and be in New York within hours. So we utilize social media to help us find our missing. It's instantaneous and it has a far reach. And all we need is one person to come forward with information. And we receive a lot of our tips via social media. And some of them have resulted in, in a person being recovered. As Natalie mentioned, social media is a blessing and it's also a curse. I know right now so many parents, grandparents, aunts and uncles are dealing with the fact that their kids are learning online and these predators are actually using these platforms to lure our children um, online. How many out there have heard of the game Roblox? I have a daughter. My daughter is 11 years old and she absolutely loves that game. Now that is one of those free platforms that a lot of predators are oh my using goodness. to get to children. You know, this man, he used Roblox to lure an eight year old Michigan girl into sending nude videos. You know, there was a 12 year old that was lured using Roblox because someone went into the chat room. So this is happening. And, and of course these kids look at it as innocent fun, these games that they're playing, but how many of you parents are actually going into their chat box to see what they're actually communicating? You know, these predators are using social media every single day. And I think it's very important for parents to not be your children's friend, but be their parent, be that nosy parent, see who they're communicating with, you know, check their phones, check their gaming devices. We're talking about the, the PS, we're talking about any platform that they're using. Uh, my son, he has an Xbox, you know, all of these devices, whether it's in their hand with their phones or if it's their gaming system, these predators are using those platforms. You have these uh, predators right here, that's all picture how they use online media to lure kids for sex trafficking out of New Jersey. And here's this right here, this slide is very important. And our presentation will be available for those participants that would like a copy. But I really think that all the parents, aunts, uncles, grandparents should be aware and always be mindful because technology is constantly evolving. But see if your children or your grandchildren have any of these apps downloaded on their phone and see who they're communicating with and exactly the extent of the conversations that they're having. So as Natalie stated earlier, this is a pandemic. Um, we're dealing with COVID-19. We're also dealing with the fact that we have uh, missing people in our community and we simply don't hear about them. But what we want to do is arm our community with the tips and protecting your 
loved ones, especially online. So we're going to go through a couple of tips. I'm not going to read through all of them. I can flip through. But, you know, one of the first things that we can do as parents is set up the parental controls. Regularly check online to see what your children are doing and who they're communicating with. Spend time with them online. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that Natalie always say, we say to families that um, when you're using social media, create that fictitious account, befriend your child and see exactly how much information that they're sharing with you. Because you know, if they're sharing this information with you as a stranger, they're going to share it with someone else. And that right there can start that uncomfortable conversation in your household. There are no take backs online. I think that's very important for kids. They like to share pictures. Once it goes out there to the World Wide Web, you can't get it back. I don't care if you delete it, it's still in cyberspace. Supervise the photos and videos that they're putting out there. Avoid meeting face to face. You know, they will meet someone online, and the next thing they want to do is meet them out in public. So talk to your children about meeting these people out in public. Uh, disallow access to chat rooms. I mentioned chat rooms a minute ago. They like to come into the chat rooms and it may start as a simple, innocent conversation. Hi, hello, how are you? What's your name? And then it continues to evolve. And last but not least, you know, check the online activity on a regular basis. I can't stress this enough. During this pandemic, because this has been a very difficult time, we have had so many children that have been victims of human trafficking that we have been working on. And this is something that missing persons has been an issue for quite some time, but the numbers have truly increased during this pandemic. Mm -hmm. And we realized earlier that we had to build alliances or partnerships with media outlets particularly outlets of color like Essence and Ebony, News One, Huffington Post. And they have really helped us bring awareness to these issues and as well as sharing some of our profiles. But I also believe that once our community gets more involved, once a child has been reported and we get that involvement within our community, we start making phone calls and we start utilizing our um, influence, it really helps to eradicate this issue. Last season, Showtime's The Shy and HBO Insecure, they had some backstories about missing women. And thankfully, we were able to partner with them to bring awareness on a national program. And they use their podcast as well as social media platform and that was a really big win for the organization and for the families that we serve. But again, that media, especially that national media coverage is so vital in bringing awareness to our missing, finding them and just fighting this battle. Fantastic. Should there be audio with this? So, yeah, it should be. But what Derek is, is showing is um, these are some of the cast members of um, The Shy, HBO's The Shy. I'm sorry, Showtime The Shy. And they wanted to help us. They are as angry as we are about the issue. And they had BAM5 t shirts. And this is Wendy. She's the one who organized it and wanted to use your platform to help us. I can miss your foundation. Please go to BAMFI.org. My name is Alex Hibbert, and I stand with the Black and Missing Foundation. I stand with the Black and Missing Foundation. I am Michael Ellis, and I stand with the Black and Missing Foundation. No, I stand with the Black and Missing Foundation. They help us find out. And I hope you will too. Mm. Well, thank you so much. This is incredible information. I do have some questions. And I don't want to assume that you're finished. Maybe there was something else you wanted to add? Before mm -hmm. No, I just wanted to close saying this is what we need. We need our community to stand together with us because it's not just law enforcement and the media's role, 
to highlight this issue, but our community need to get involved and we need people to rally around the organization and these families. I noticed your photographs. First of all, I just wanna say that you all are a perfect duo. Um, you have the, the media insight so that you know how to present this information so beautifully. And you have the, the, the background in, um, in policing and, and understanding what it looks like to see a runaway on the streets, what it looks like to see someone with mental issues on the streets. Um, so you, you have that, that great balance of knowledge. Um, what I'd, I'd love to see are high school students and middle school students become involved in this um, so that we could actually um, get them to look out for each other in a different way. Um, there's a recognition and, and I'm just gonna ask probably a question and then we're gonna move on because I know we wanna save the questions for the end. But um, I'd like to know like what kind of, what kind of individuals do you generally see that are missing? And the reason I ask that is because the photographs you showed seem to reflect young people. I didn't see um, any 50 year olds, but maybe I did and they just look really young. Is this typically a, um, is this typically within a, people that are within a range, an age range that, that are missing primarily? We have people going missing all walks of life. Um, we cover children, um, men, women, you know, seniors. So it's all walks of life that comes through our organization, sadly. Right. Yes, and I agree one with Derricka. We're seeing every age. Um, we're mm -hmm. seeing babies that are disappearing, that are you know being abducted. We're seeing grandparents who are mm -hmm. suffering from dementia or Alzheimer's, and they're walking away from their caregivers. And you know it's really hard to find them. One of the things we have to do is change the the, the narrative. I know with law enforcement, oftentimes they label our children as runaways. And runaways do not receive the Amber Alert. We do not classify any of our missing. If you don't know where your child is or your grandchild, that that kid is missing. We do not even mm -hmm. use that with our organization because that's not the case in most cases. And if again, if the child is a runaway, nine times out of ten, they can be lured into human trafficking. I really want to get to that, but um, what we're going to do first is go to our state's attorney and hear from her. And then at the end, I think we will talk about how all of this works into um, potential organized crime like sex trafficking um, with, some of our, with some of our missing um, and how they are abducted into that life. They don't choose that life. So um, at this time, I want to first of all, thank you again um, because you're doing incredible work and you're working through Banffy to help us find us. So thank you. Thank you. Um, time, it's my pleasure to introduce our next presenter who may need no introduction, State's Attorney of Prince George's County, Aisha Braveboy. As State's Attorney, Aisha Braveboy is a top law enforcement officer in the county, responsible for the safety and security of over 900,000 residents. Her motto for the office under uh, her administration is, crime is personal. Personal to the victim, personal to the community, and personal to the State's Attorney's office. Ms. Bravevoy is ushering in significant changes in how individuals and cases are handled to ensure not only that justice is administered in Prince George's County, but that it's done fairly. During the first uh, ever State of Justice event, she announced that her office will no longer require cash bail as a requirement for pretrial releases in cases where the person is not a danger to society and does not pose a flight risk. Uh, this is a major policy change, which will ensure that individuals who cannot afford bail will not languish in jail. She has also recognized uh, or reorganized her juvenile justice unit and created community partnerships to end the school to prison pipeline, one of her major priorities. And I'm very excited to work with her on that. Ms. Braveboy has created a number of new units in her office to better address criminal justice needs. The Public Integrity Unit forces, uh, focuses on police misconduct, excessive use of force, and corruption cases. The Conviction and Sentencing Integrity Unit, the only one of its kind in the state, reviews cases where there's a, there are questions or doubts about a sentence uh, that has been handed down. In addition, Ms. Braveboy is expanding diversion opportunities and diversion programs. Uh, she has 
doubled the number of participants in the uh, Back on Track program, which focuses on giving first time felony drug offenders a second chance. This brave boy graduated from the University of Maryland College Park, where she received her Bachelor of Arts degree in government and politics. She also received her Juris Doctorate from Howard University School of Law. Aisha Brave Boy, thank you for being here and welcome. Thank you so much, Councilwoman Anderson Walker. It is such a privilege to be with you um, because, you know, really the, the initiatives that you take on are so meaningful and so thoughtful and so important for our community. And so tonight's dialogue, I, I think, will hit home for so many people. Um, and when I listened uh, to Derricka and Natalie, uh, and when they said, you know, say her name, I, I immediately thought of Relisha Rudd. I, I don't think any of us uh, will ever forget um, the images of that beautiful little girl who no one knew where she was. And um, it touched many of us, uh, but also, um, you know, we knew about her here. Uh, we talked about her for several days, several months. Mm -hmm. But when I think about uh, the type of coverage, uh, as was stated, that is given to uh, uh, individuals who are not black, who are not brown, um, it, it, there is a disparity and it is very disheartening uh, because she's a beautiful little girl uh, who we want to find and we hope to find at some point. Um, but, um, and, and I know that we're also going to hear from Dr. Lightfoot in, in getting that uh, medical, you know, perspective on why individuals uh, go missing is so critically important to addressing this issue overall. And you'll see by the presentation I have uh, why it's so important to figure out why people go missing because oftentimes they are found, but the question is, why were they missing in the first place? And so I am going to share my screen, I think. <laughs> um, let's see, oh, it says I can, I cannot share my screen. Um, I would, I, I think the host needs to modify my settings, if you can make me a host so that I can share my screen. Sure, let me, um, let me get our technical people on that. Sure. Okay, perfect. Okay. I should be able to share now. Okay, oh wait, let's see. You are the host now. Okay. All right. So here we go. Thank, thank you very much for that. Um, okay. So um, let me move on to the next slide here. Okay. So uh, Prince George's County. Um, we have, we're, we're a pretty significant, uh, we have a pretty significant population. Over uh, 900,000 people live in our county. Um, but each year, uh, we have a significant number of people uh, who are reported missing. And for those whose loved one is missing, um, one is too many, right? Uh, when it is your loved one who may be missing. And so in 2018, we had about 1,160 people missing in our community. In 2019, 1,147. Mm -hmm. and in 2020, 1,000, uh, excuse me, 1,015. And these are people who were reported missing. Um, now, when you look at the racial breakdown or racial uh, composition of those who are in those categories and also the, the gender breakdown, we have that information. Uh, we have a small uh, but significant Asian population and, and in that community, uh, the numbers of individuals reported missing are relatively low. Uh, although this year um, in 2020, 
um, you saw that the number of um, Asian males doubled from five to 10 who went missing. Hmm. Um, with respect to African-Americans or black uh, people um, in 2018, 894, 2019, 830, and in 2020, 755 uh, black people uh, were reported missing in our community. Now, if you look right next to those numbers, you'll see the percentage of those who were reported missing. Uh, so in this, this uh, year, well, last year in 2020, 73% um, of all of those who were reported missing were Black, uh, while Blacks make up about 64% of the total population in our county. Again, 73% uh, of those total reported missing uh, were Black. And if you look at the male to female breakdown, uh, what you'll find is that uh, it, it, it kind of goes back and forth, but um, there's roughly equal, roughly equal amounts of, of Black men and Black women who go missing every year. Mm -hmm. And so that is something that um, I think that the, uh, the, the, the prior speaker spoke to, that it, it is, you know, all genders. <laughs> um, our, we have a very uh, significant Hispanic population in our county, roughly about 19 or 20% of our population is Hispanic. And Hispanics make up around 19% uh, of those who are missing uh, in our communities. However, that may be underreported. And the reason why may be underreported is because oftentimes um, individuals who are not documented don't report other individuals who are not documented as missing. And so that number may be artificially low based on, um, unfortunately, our immigration laws and uh, individual statuses in this country. Um, and um, when it comes to individuals who are considered, who, who are white in our communities, uh, they make up a, a much lower percentage of our missing. Um, and actually the, their percentage of our population is about 12% of the, per, their percentage of those individuals who are considered missing um, are, is much lower than that, maybe around six or 7%. So there, there are, we can see at least some racial disparities, especially amongst black individuals in our community that are reported missing. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you can look at the bottom uh, and you can see our, our critical missing, which are considered those individuals who are missing under circumstances where they may be considered that, where they may be considered that they are in danger. So you can see that there is a, 69 of those individuals uh, went missing this year or last year, excuse me. Now, when we talk about missing, most individuals who go missing actually return at some point. Um, and so about 97% of individuals, at least in Prince George's County who go missing for some period of time and typically it's between 24 and 72 hours those individuals do return. However, uh, we do have um, significant numbers of people who don't return. And I call it significant, even though it may be a small percentage. Again, if, you, if it is your family member, it is too many. So each of these, this is not just a number, these are individuals. And as you can see, uh, again, with the breakdown, um, uh, Black, uh, in our community uh, have a higher rate of, of not returning uh, to our to back into our community or being identified as having returned to our communities. And this is a pretty significant number. Um, and if you look at um, in particular, uh, there's, a, there's not a, a huge disparity when it comes to black men and black women, but if you look at our Hispanic population, you'll see that um, at least in 2020, there were there was a significant number of Hispanic women versus Hispanic males who did not return. And so again, uh, those may be indicators of you know the vulnerability of 
women in the Hispanic community, but it also shows a vulnerability of Black people generally, um, both male and female, uh, who go missing and stay missing. And again, um, while the number might be relatively small, again, each one of those individuals and those families, uh, you know, they are impacted for the rest of their lives. Um, and so again, overall, our, our numbers of, uh, these are just our overall numbers of total missing persons cases, those who were reported critically missing, those who did not return. And you'll see that in 2020, that number is, is much higher than it was in 2018 and 2019. And we think there's some reasons for that. Um, um, and it, when, when you look at, and I'll get into that in a second, um, but if you look at um, males of all ages, uh, excuse me, uh, females of all ages, uh, we had in 2020, 520, 10 females of all ages uh, reported missing and uh, 54 did not return. So there are 54 families at least who are devastated. And that's pretty, again, pretty significant. So if you look at it, um, about 10% of our females who reported missing didn't return. So that that's pretty, that's, that's a big issue. When we look at our juveniles, um, now, a significant number of those who are reporting, excuse me, reported missing are juveniles. They're young people. And um, so if you remember, we have a, a roughly around 1,100 or so people who are missing. So well over half of them who are reported missing are juveniles. So I'm just gonna go to 2020. We had 606 juveniles reported missing, 57 of them did not return. That's 9.4%. So if you can imagine, these are very young people who went missing and uh, their families uh, have not found them. There are reasons we think um, that um, the numbers are a little, a little higher this year in terms of individuals who did not, or last year, sorry, in 2020, individuals who did not return mainly because they are not being identified. You know, maybe where they usually would go hang out a business or something like that, they're not, it's not open. So they're not going there to hang out um, or it has limited hours or limited capacity. People are wearing masks, so it's harder to identify people. Um, young people are not in school. So sometimes it's not necessarily that the family member that would report the person missing, but sometimes it's a teacher or a counselor or some other responsible adult or even their friends who notice that they're no longer there. So it's a, so, so the dynamics of our communities have changed and sometimes it does not work out well for people who are in dangerous or high risk situations because they don't have outside advocates there to support them. Um, I did want to talk about a couple of alert systems that uh, Prince George's County has. Uh, we do have the Amber Alert, and um, the Amber Alert uh, is issued when law enforcement agencies determine that a child under the age of 18 has been abducted and is in danger of serious bodily harm or death. And the Amber Alert instantly galvanizes communities to assist in the search uh, for in the search for and recovery of an abducted child. And again, um, I think that, you know, we, and I'm sure we'll have dialogue about it, but the, but the question is how and when do we use that Amber Alert? And I think that would be a very important question uh, for us to, to discuss. And then we have a Silver Alert, and that is a public notification system in, in, in the US and we use it here in uh, Maryland and in Prince George's County to broadcast information about endangered adults or high risk mis missing people or missing endangered children. And so there's, um, you know, uh, I think we'll see it on, sometimes on the highway, you'll see silver alert, um, those silver, silver alert uh, signs that are on, posted in our highway or spread across our highway. And, and, it, and it is really important that we pay attention to those because oftentimes those individuals have Alzheimer's or dementia or other uh, mental uh, disabilities. And it is very, important that we locate them as quickly as possible. 
And um, as we look at, you know, why uh, individuals are reported missing, um, and I think maybe, uh, in, you know, the councilwoman, I'd love to work with her on this. Maybe we can find a better way of documenting it because we really just have really anecdotal information based on, you know, conversations that we might have with families. And I know our police department uh, does their best to try to determine why someone was missing, but I don't know that we are able to capture that data in a way that we can really utilize to determine uh, what interventions our communities need so that more, especially our children, don't go missing for any period of time. But sometimes um, they're estranged from their family for one reason or another. Oftentimes it's because of abuse, whether they're being physically abused or a parent or someone in the household is being abused. Um, Sometimes they're worried about their immigration status. That is an issue, not just for the Hispanic community, but we have um, Asian um, members of our community and Caribbean and African members of our community who may not be documented. And so their immigration status becomes an issue for them. And uh, sometimes they go missing or, and, or, and are not reported sometimes. Um, but the majority of people what, what they say is that they're quote unquote voluntarily missing. But I, I, we use quotes there because, you know, no one we, we think that lives in a, a good structured environment. Uh, there, there are very few people that will leave that environment unless they really feel like they have to. And so, so when, we sit, when, when people are considered voluntarily missing, they may have made the decision to leave, but it's not because it's really what they want to do. Sometimes it's what they believe they have to do. Um, homelessness is, is another issue. Um, again, some children run away, but the question is why are they running? Um, they're foster children often that kind of get lost in um, lost in the system and just lost in life because of the, the stresses and the trauma of being in a system where you may be bouncing around from family to family. So, so those are some of the reasons, but there are plenty of more and I'm sure we'll get into that. Um, again, if someone you know goes missing, please call um, your local law enforcement. 911 is important or go and go to your uh, local district station to report them right away. Um, make sure you have a picture of them, something that where people can identify them, uh, let law enforcement know uh, where, you last, where you last saw the person. You can share the social media, social media alerts from law enforcement on your social media pages. I know that our uh, police department is really excellent about putting information up about missing individuals, and that's great, great and important information to share with the community. Um, and if you have a problem, again, I, I think our police department does a great job in this area, but if you ever have a problem and you want someone to follow up on your case, you can of course contact our office at 301-952-3500. But again, the, our police department does a great job um, handling missing persons. And so we certainly wanna make sure that you contact the appropriate law enforcement um, agency if someone goes missing. But again, thank you so much for having us. And um, I appreciate this opportunity. So I'm gonna stop sharing and um, turn the floor back over to our wonderful host, Councilwoman Monique Anderson-Walker. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, very informative. I, I think we're all probably curious as to um, how do black and brown missing people compare to um, white missing people? Uh, is it, do will we see the same numbers in a similar population? Uh, or because you did state this is something that's common throughout the nation. Yeah, and, and you know, those numbers are for Prince George's County and I won't pretend to be able to speak for every place, but I think what we've heard and certainly I think your, your other um, presenters uh, probably have done a little bit more research on this, but what we have found at least here in Prince George's County is that um, there is a di disproportionate number, especially of Black people who are reporting 
reported missing every year uh, based on our population size in our in our county. Um, with respect to Hispanics, we think that may be underreporting, quite mm -hmm. frankly, because again of the immigration issues. But um, but with our white population, we're seeing um, sort of below demographic, you know, um, uh, makeup. The, the 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 number of missing persons are, are lower actually than their population size in our communities. So um, I don't I can't say that's true every single place, but I, I think that it is in, it it is informative. I think it is, and, and you know, you all bring up some great points with equity. Um, there certainly is not equity in reporting um, people of color who are missing. We don't really hear it as often, um, certainly not to the degree with others. Um, you made up a, a wonderful point about homelessness, and we know that that is uh, homelessness is not just living on the street; it's just having instability in housing. So it could be, you know, we're living with auntie for two months, then you know, I'm gonna live with my cousin. You know, it's it happens. Uh, and in this COVID period, I think we've seen people who are who are really hit harder with the reality of homelessness in this way uh, because of the instability of, of work. Uh, and, and I'd like to see what that correlation is with our missing and this instability of home life. Um, yeah, we definitely saw an increase, a significant increase last year. So I think that is something, especially those who are uh, who did not return. So I think that is something that we should focus on as we're now dealing with the second year of, of the pandemic as well. Well, it's fantastic. And we'll get back uh, to you with questions. Thank you so much again. I appreciate you. And now we're going to speak with, um, with Dr. Lynn Light, but I'd like to introduce you to her. She's an obstetrician and gynecologist and a friend of mine. Um, Dr. Lynn Lightfoot joined Fox Hall OBGYN in 2005. She completed her undergraduate studies from Wellesley College. She received her medical degree from the University of Virginia and completed her residency in obstetric and gynecology at the Albert Einstein Medical Center in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Dr. Lightfoot is a board certified, is board certified by the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology. Dr. Lightfoot's practice encompasses the full spectrum of, of obstetrics and gynecology. Her goal is to provide personalized care from adolescence, fertility, pregnancy, menopause, and beyond. <clears throat> Dr. Lightfoot has uh, consist consistently been named as one of Washingtonians' best doctors. Dr. Lightfoot is a rare find, a native of Washington, D.C. Uh, she also has a distinction of being the first Fox Hall doctor who was actually delivered by Fox Hall OBGYN. <laughs> So technically, she has been affiliated with Fox Hall OBGYN uh, the longest of any of their doctors. Um, she is active in her community through numerous civic and charitable organizations. And I just have to add, she delivered my nephew. So uh, she's very special to me on many levels. Um, you, might, you might be questioning, well, this is Black and missing. Why do we have a, an ob um, to speak? But the truth is, we do have this same type of disparity uh, and lack of equity in, in healthcare. And it's reflected in the number of uh, mortality, child mortality, baby mortality, and, and uh, maternal mortality in childbirth or as a result of childbirth. So we will be hearing um, about that and, and look to see how we can educate our community so that we don't have to miss any more people, that we actually get to meet them and they get to thrive in this life. Uh, so thank you again, Dr. Uh, Lynn Light, but take it away. Uh, thank you, uh, Council, <laughs> Councilwoman Monique Anderson Walker, I, for that lovely introduction. Um, and yes, it was a joy to have the opportunity and the honor to be able to deliver your nephew. Um, when you think of pregnancy, you think of pregnancy being something fun and exciting. And Lately, if all of you have been reading the news and hearing things that have been going on, you know the statistics as it pertains to Black women and pregnancy is sometimes very startling and scary. Um, often I get the question that, am I gonna die during my pregnancy? Am I going to have a great outcome? And the statistics are not great. Um, 700 women in the United States die each year from pregnancy-related causes. And there was a time when the mortality rate was 50%, and for some of us, it's much greater. Black women specifically are 
more likely uh, to die from pregnancy as compared to their counterparts. A third of those deaths occur um, during pregnancy, a third of those deaths happen at delivery, and a third of those deaths happen within the first year after delivery, which is the postpartum period. Um, the largest causes of those deaths are from um, heart disease and other cardiovascular disorders, from hypertension, from non-cardiovascular diseases, from complications of pregnancy, high blood pressure, um, bleeding, abnormal bleeding, and hemorrhage during pregnancy and delivery, infection, and cardiomyopathies, which are damages to the heart muscle. 60% um, of these things can actually be prevented. And the most important thing we can do is try to identify what's the best way to decrease these morbidity and mortality rates so that pregnant women, particularly black pregnant women, don't have to be um, scared and afraid to get pregnant and they can be hopeful and excited and also systemically help future generations to come. Um, there are, uh, there, there are several hypotheses and thoughts as to how these things occur and why we have an increased morbidity and mortality, particularly um, in different, in different uh, demographics within our community. Um, specifically, there is, a, there is a concept that there is a long-term toxic stress that Black women experience in pregnancy, and that's because of, uh, if I explain it in people terms, if you we are the salt of the earth. We take care of our community. Uh, we are the nurturers. We take care of our mothers, our fathers, our sisters, our friends, um, our husbands, our children. We are the expert problem solvers. We are the CEOs of our household. We are doing just about everything. And with all that we can do and all that we can multitask, um, those things actually affect our physical body. And that in itself is a stressor. And in the lives that we live today, and we know very clearly how stressful our everyday lives are, on top of that, pregnancy is an additional stressor. So we are experiencing something different in pregnancy than some of our counterparts. And the higher our um, our status is in terms of our jobs and our economic development, the higher our risk is, and which is quite an alarming concept. Um, so the better access you have to healthcare, the worse you actually may, your outcome may be. And that's, that's a scary thought. So we need, there are several different ways that we can, that have been identified in terms of um, how do we beat this, right? How, how, do we, how, do we, how do we make this better? Um, there are, there's legislation that can be done to support um, women and soon to be mothers and mothers as it pertains to their health. There are healthcare mechanisms that can be implemented and um, enforced. Um, there are, resources that can be provided through um, government access, local government, federal government, um, healthcare systems that can be done um, as it pertains to me, let's say as an individual, I'm just a private practitioner and I see patients in my office every day and I take call in the hospital to deliver patients and perform surgeries. And the things that I can work on as an individual person are just trying to re reduce and work on the um, implicit healthcare biases that, um, that exist and with, within our own healthcare community. Um, the, uh, it's, it's definitely an all hands on deck approach in order to do it, but we all have to work together to do it. And until all of those things are in place, it's gonna be a partnership between mothers and their doctors, patients and their doctors, um, establishing those kinds of relationships. 
Um, it's really important that um, women and their doctors have a relationship in which it is a trusted relationship. It's a safe place where um, patients can feel comfortable um, asking the questions that they don't understand, having a safe environment to say, hey, this is my situation. How can I how, how can I change my lifestyle or how can I address my healthcare needs without compromising everything else that I have to do? Because those are the biggest challenges that I find that people that really prevent us from getting the healthcare that we need. Um, and, and all of those things together are our best way to really manifest self-care because self-care sounds like something we all don't get to have a part of, but it's actually the most important way we can get this done. Um, we have to be our best advocate. So you have to be the best advocate you can be for yourself. I always encourage patients when they, I'm just their OBGYN. However, patients have their primary care doctors and their endocrinologists and other doctors. So I always tell patients, hey, if you get, what, what medications are you taking? And when one doesn't know what their medications are, I want you to make sure that you find out who's the last doctor that you saw and when did you see them and what medication are you taking? What is it? Why are you taking it? And it's okay to ask, like, I don't understand why I was taking this. I just took it because they gave it to me and I don't know what it is. Or they told me I needed to have a procedure and I don't know what procedure I had. So it's definitely a partnership. We have to be our best advocates so that we get exactly what it is that we need. And then we have to we have to make the doctors explain it to us in people terms and so that we can understand it. That is, that's the most important part. I can explain it in doctor terms, but can I explain it in terms that you can go home and then say, these are the changes that I need to make in my lifestyle so that I can have a better outcome. Um, so that, that's the partnership that's actually the most important part. Um, I, that, that would probably be my best message. I am going to turn that back to you, Councilwoman and hopefully be able to answer some of your questions um, and the questions of the attendees, because I think that's, that's the best way to get that message out. It's, does there, do we all understand it so that we can take it home and make it, make it a reality? Yeah, thank you so much for that information. Um, I know uh, many, many people have had high risk deliveries uh, because of age. Some, some of us wanna work to a point where we feel confident that we can take care of a child and maybe want to have our first child at 42 or 43. And that's not that uncommon anymore. Maybe you can tell me whether it's becoming a little bit more the norm. We definitely have there. Are, women are getting pregnant later in life because we can do more. We have more technology. We have more information. The biggest risk when it comes to women getting pregnant when they're older, as we get older, is the risk of having chromosome abnormalities. We are now able to do tests, to test and screen for chromosome abnormalities at a much earlier gestational age, meaning earlier in the pregnancy, we're able to identify if there are chromosome abnormalities that may be associated with women being over the age of 35. And being able to test for those things at 10 weeks or at 11 weeks, as opposed to waiting to find out at 20 weeks. Um, we, there are opportunities and there's information out there that's available it should be available to everybody to find out these things so that women can get pregnant at, and have healthy pregnancies at, at later stages, um, which was not always the case. Yeah. Um, also with our teenagers, and then I'm gonna turn it over to um, those who are watching now to ask their questions. Uh, we do have a few here as well that we'll ask at the end. But um, just curious about young teenagers um, who, who have children. Um, are you, I guess I'm trying to figure out where is, where are we finding the loss um, when, we're, when we're kind of plotting out um, those women who die either during pregnancy, um, at delivery or uh, postpartum? Um, are we seeing that there's some sort of a trend that we can follow and try to work? Really, the, the, um, the largest percentage of women that have these have complications and uh, end up uh, unfortunately dying in pregnancy tend to be uh, probably older, meaning maybe older the age of over 30, as opposed to seeing young teen pregnancies mm -hmm. um, with where you have increased um, mortality. That's not to say that there are not severe 
um, significant complications that occur with teenagers in pregnancy, particularly preeclampsia, eclampsia, which can lead to renal disorders, which can lead to long-term um, renal abnormalities, dialysis, requiring a kidney transplant, you know, mm -hmm. complications like that that can actually really change the trajectory of one's life. So making sure that teenagers either get the prenatal care that they need um, or have the resources that they need after they've had a pregnancy so that they can plan, plan accordingly. Yeah, resources are important. Um, and do you have resources that you could, can you direct us to resources? Planned Parenthood. Yes. Planned Parenthood is, is a great resource um, and it's a place to start. Great. Um, do we have any live questions out there or will I be reading these? I'm talking to my technical team. Do we have anyone who would like to ask a question? Uh, I'd like you all, you go ahead to read, read the questions you have right now, Councilwoman, and then we'll open it up to the question and answer for the audience. Okay. Well, you know, while, let me ask um, Derica and Natalie, because I'm very curious about what kind of programs we can implement to bring more attention to uh, Black and Missing um, and to help us find us. Do you have any suggestions? as to what we can do uh, either on the local level, uh, in government, certainly in, in uh, conjunction with the state's attorney's office. Um, do you have recommendation? Absolutely. Um, the first one is creating laws and policies at the state and local level that provide resources for searching and recovery um, and to promote equal protection for all. So making sure that, you know, whether it's a, you know, a child of black or white, that they're getting fair or equal treat in the recovery effort. And we know that a lot of our children who are victims of sex trafficking, they age out of the system. Yeah. So they are not getting resources that they need. So we're counting on you to change the laws in Prince George's County. And, and definitely one of the other laws we would like to see change is, you know, the, there's a myth that people must wait 24 hours. Um, I think, you know, if there's someone that's missing, it needs to be taken immediately. We can't always wait the 24 and 48 hours because time is of the essence. Understood. Um, now tell me about self-esteem. Um, do you think that self-esteem has, if there's some connection with, I don't want to assume people who are missing or runaways. Um, and I don't want to assume that uh, they willingly went with someone, but but do you think that maybe instituting some programs in our schools to work on self-esteem that that uh, that could help? I think that plays a huge role. Um, you know, one of the things that we've seen over this whole pandemic, you know, there is a correlation between missing persons and domestic violence as well. And that's something that we're not talking about. So now that these children, their home, um, a lot of them are going to school and that's their outlet um, mm -hmm. to get away from those abusive parents. So some of the cases that we've seen an increase in, it has been a result of uh, violence inside the home and they've turned to look for love in all the wrong places online and, and with people that they're meeting. And, and so we're seeing a huge mm -hmm. increase in that. And to piggyback on what Derek has said, we do know that the pimps, they latch onto these children that are vulnerable. They're looking for love. They're looking for the basic food security, um, yeah. anything to make them feel worthy. So we definitely have to tap our schools, our children in the elementary, middle school, high school, and to provide them with the resources that they need so that they don't have to rely on these pimps and predators to take care of them. Because once they go into the system, um, they have to repay the pimps back some way, somehow. So we just need to build their self-esteem a, a lot. And, and one last point that I would like to make is the fact that these pimps are using peers, so the children's peers, to recruit them. Um, we've seen an increase in that. And so I think it's something that across the board holistically, 
you know, there needs to be enhanced training, whether it's on the school level, law enforcement level, so we can identify and also so parents can identify a change in behavior and get to know, we got to get back to the basis as Natalie stated, you know, get to know your children's friends and their parents. Yeah, this is incredible information because I think people are so busy. They assume, you know, kids raise themselves these days. Absolutely. Um, give them, you know, here's your cell phone, play with this, I'm busy. Um, but I think that, that you bring up excellent points about you've got to be on top of who they're connecting with and what they might be looking for. If they think they're not getting the attention at home, they're going to try to get it somewhere else and mm -hmm. it's the attention they need to be getting. Uh, we had a program two years ago called Wow Factor, and it's women of wellness, uh, women of wealth, women of, of wholeness, you know, all these things to empower us. But we had a speaker who um, had been sex trafficked, and uh, she was incredible. Young woman in her 20s um, spoke about how she had a rough home life. And that uh, there was an older guy who gave her attention and took her out and told her she was pretty and you know, all the things that you hear. Um, and she ended up getting into a life where she was sex trafficked. And she was so open in speaking with us um, that you know, those of us in the audience were just kind of in awe at how transparent she was uh, and brilliant. So this, this is not a, she wasn't someone who one would think could easily be uh, manipulated. So I think that's the other thing. Sometimes you look at people and think, oh, you're strong. You know, no one's going to manipulate you. That's not the case. You know, if you feel you're missing something, don't feel that solid at the core. It is very easy to be manipulated. Um, so I do want to put that out there and see what we can do um, together to get into our high schools. Because even if it's something like the videotape, um, you know, getting something that, that they can show in a program, but, it, you know, let's, let's, let's talk some more. We'll definitely talk some more um, about how we can really attack this. We want to get our kids solid at the core. I think the first thing is deal with their food and housing insecurities to the degree that we can. Because if you're taking mm -hmm. care of that, they feel secure enough to not have to go out to seek that. So thank you so much, um, appreciate that. Um, with our state's attorney, um, Aisha Brayboy, thank you so much again. And I wanna find out what we can do, what laws that are in place now to favor victims in trafficking, one, and if we can work on strengthening those. Well, right now, um, we have a lot of laws to protect victims of human trafficking. And actually in my office, um, we no longer prosecute any um, commercial sex workers or individuals who may be being trafficked and involved in commercial sex work as a result of um, being trafficked. And so that is really great because what they know is that there will not be a penalty for them. And in fact, not only will there not be a penalty, um, but we also have worked uh, with Courtney's House uh, with um, Catholic Charities in the University of Maryland Safe Center as mm -hmm. our referral partners who actually provide services, one-on-one -on -one services to uh, victims of human trafficking or just commercial sex workers generally. And we find that that is really helpful because a lot of times they do need, you know, a place to stay, some money, yeah, some individuals have kids, and so they, you know, they, so they need um, some level of security that they can take care of themselves and possibly take care of um, people who are depending on them. And so um, that is a great program that I started probably within my first six months of being uh, in, in office. Um, but what I think uh, we could do better and do more of is really uh, figuring out why people are leaving in the first place and really beginning to document that more. Um, mm -hmm. Because again, 97% of, of the people return, but how are they returning and why did they leave in the first place? You know, is it, you know, food insecurity or housing insecurity? Is it domestic violence? Is it something else? You know, is it that low self-esteem? Are they meeting people online? Are they, you know, engaging in, you know, uh, sex work or forced uh, sex work or, you know, 
we don't know <laughs> oftentimes. I mean, maybe again, anecdotally we know, but we don't know what percentage of those children. So if you look at over half of the people who go missing for a period of time are kids. And you can say, oh, they ran away. They didn't want to be at home that night. But if there's a well-functioning household, and I'm not saying that, you know, sometimes kids don't want to be kids and run off with their friends every now and again, that happens. But by and large, children are not going to not return to their homes. They're not going to not let their parents know where they are if they have um, a well-functioning structured household that it's meeting their needs. And so I think it's really important for us to begin documenting why these children go missing because a child that goes missing one day or anyone who goes missing, quite frankly, could be in danger. That could be a homicide. It could be a, that they're a victim of you know, sexual assault or rape. These are things that happen when no one knows where you are. And so it's really important that we begin to figure out why these young people are leaving. And then we can work with our schools to do things. Like you said, um, the councilwoman, do we need to work on their self-esteem? Is it, do we need to provide more counseling services? Or, you know, is there something we can do as a community? Because if it is your child, yeah. you know, that doesn't come home that night, it's not just a number. That's, right. that's your baby. <laughs> so personal. like you said, it's personal. It's personal. <laughs> you know, you've had, uh, so many um, initiatives that you put in place that are just so thoughtful and, and very personal. So um, I, I feel your passion and everything that you do. Um, kind of curious and in, in working through where we are in COVID as to what might be happening. You know, it used to be when kids were in schools, the teachers would see them and say, mm, something's not right, come on, talk to me, what's happening? You know, or the, the school psychiatrist, uh, psychologist would say, um, you're acting a little different, you know. I, I've been observing you. I've, I've observed, observed you for years or for weeks or months, and I see some changes. <clears throat> That's not happening. Right. So it, to the degree, you know, Zoom, you can see but so much. Um, so there's concern there. Uh, there's an, also an understanding that uh, during the COVID period, many more teenagers, young, young people, have gone out to work in order to help the family. And that's, that's unusual. Um, but what kind of work are they getting into? That's the other thing. And, and what are they being allowed to do? Maybe even by their parents. And that's just a statement I have to make because I think that, you know, we got to consider that, that that's, this is survival. And when people are in survival mode, what they will do. We do know that the um, age range of, of kids who get caught up in this is actually not high school students. These are middle, middle school students. So it's the 11 and 12 year olds um, when you're going through your little changes and, and trying to be grown, because I don't know a better way of saying it, that is when um, one is likely to, to start getting lured into um, dysfunctional relationships. And maybe we'll just call them that because whether they're uh, legitimate relationships or whether they're um, being pimped as, as what was um, suggested earlier, that's a critical time. So we, we've got to really look at that elementary, middle school, time to, to make children feel secure to the degree that we can. And as a society, we have to figure out how to get that done because we can't lose the generations. Um, and we can't damage young boys and young girls, allow them to become damaged through uh, processes. But having said all that, what would you recommend, um, and this might be in general uh, to everyone, what would the recommend, recommendation be for, you know, if you believe your friend is being sex trafficked, what does one do? Who do who do I report it to? Well, I think if you're if you're in school, um, sometimes it's easier to report to that favorite teacher or that favorite counselor or something like that. Uh, someone who can talk to them in a way that they are comfortable, because um, if they are being trafficked, oftentimes the person who is controlling them, um, they feel either threatened by them or they feel that they owe a debt to them for some reason, right. whether it is they're providing them with money or 
food or shelter or what have you, there's something that they are getting that they probably feel like they need. And so, you know, approaching them in a way that is non threatening is extremely important because you want them to open up. Um, mm -hmm. I used to work at Children's National um, at the hospital, yeah. and um, we dealt with a lot of children who were victims, but they didn't necessarily consider themselves. Uh, to be victims. And so you also can't approach them like everyone believes that they are a victim right. um, because sometimes they, they really don't. So you just have to give them that respect, which is really oftentimes what they are looking for. They are looking for, you know, some type of validation. Um, so if someone does believe that, you know, that their peer is being sex trafficked, then definitely talking to their uh, a, a trusted counselor or teacher is important. But because we're in this COVID pandemic world, you know, that may not be something that's an option. And so, you know, talking to their own parents and having their parent contact the, the child's parent, I think, is another option, assuming that those that the, the, the parent of the child who may be in danger is not a part of the abuse. So making that hopefully making that assumption, they can, you know, uh, even have the parents talk to the other parent, and then they can try to approach that with their child. But it is a very sensitive subject. It's difficult. But if, if the person, the child believes that it's critical, that the person is absolutely in danger, then you have to call authorities because we have to protect each other. And part of that is calling the appropriate people. And in that case, it may be the police. Yeah. Thank you, I appreciate that. And I'm gonna actually have a different question um, for uh, Derica. Uh, there are educators that have been concerned about increased online exploitation of young people uh, while in the pandemic. What are some practical suggestions uh, you can recommend for combating this? You know, it's, in, it's extremely important for uh, parents to guardians to monitor the activity that's happening online. And I do understand that with the teachers, especially when they're teaching remotely, it's very difficult for them to be inside the home to see what's happening. But I think, you know, we can send out correspondence to parents, you know, show them these apps, let them know what's happening so they can, you know, pay attention to what their children are doing. That's the very minimum. Um, we need to also have our kids, you know, in our community, it's that no snitching. People don't want to talk. Yeah. But if the yeah. friends see something or know something, they should say something. And we should create those safe environments for them to report things so that we can save these children that could be victimized. Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting, but I think to some degree, um, culturally, in some school situations, it's accepted. Um, it, students have accepted that they watch their friend in an abusive relationship as an acceptable relationship. So there's a bigger issue. I just, we got to work. We got to figure it out. I'm glad we're having the conversation to get this up, to get it out. But there's so many, there's so many levels and layers to this. Um, it's it really is. We have to break it down, um, and you're right, we have to break it down. There's so many different levels to it. You know, oftentimes these children feel that if they're being beaten or if their boyfriend or girlfriend is um, being very vocal or abusive, that they love them. They, they love me, right. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's different months of the year that is highlighted that's, you know, for, for example, January is Human Trafficking Awareness Month. February is Teen Violence Awareness Month. When these certain months come up, we need to really talk about what's happening. We have to take a proactive approach. We can't always be reactive. We have to drill this down. We have to show them what it looks like so they can be mindful because if not, they're just accepting. Mm -hmm. I agree. You so set up like, I know Natalie could probably do this beautifully because she has a PR media background, but like putting skits together. So people can see, oh my goodness, that's me. You know, sometimes you don't see yourself in a situation until a skit. And so you see something that's played out and you see the role of, of your role kind of in that. Um, yeah. Right. And, and just having those conversations, um, like Derek said, there's so much use 
things in our community that are taboo that we don't talk about. And we have so many pillars in the community. Our churches, they need to get involved. Our civic associations and mm. having these discussions, but it's taboo to talk about mental health and sex trafficking. But that's where the people are, the congregation is, and we need, we're need. we trying to go to them and we need them to get involved and to rally not just around the organization, but these families that are desperately needing help and resources. So I see one of the questions that just popped up. Someone wanted us to share um, a success story, a recent success story. And we do have one to share. I think before we share the story, it's important for people to know when someone goes missing, the person that went missing is not the same person that comes back home because you don't know what that person endured while they were out there. So one of the recent success stories, it happened last week. We were working on a case, a young lady out of Florida, and she had been missing for two weeks. Um, she was going to a, a party, um, her, a girlfriend of hers, her mom didn't know the girlfriend, but she asked her mom, could I go to my girlfriend's party? And her mom told her no initially, and she just kept begging to go to this party. Um, she said, I'm going to be safe. I'm going to have my mask. I'm going to have all of this stuff on. So finally mom gave in. She caught an Uber to the party, um, only to find that it wasn't a party. The young lady was setting her up. She was a victim of human trafficking. She was beaten and raped repeatedly. Um, the, the abuser actually stepped out of the room for a split second, leaving her unattended for the first time after she went missing. This was about seven or eight days in. He stepped out of the room for a quick second and she ran. And she just kept running until she went to a good Samaritan who allowed her to use the cell phone and she told them that she was abducted. And so now the healing process begins because now this young lady has a long road ahead of herself. She went through a lot in those two uh -huh. weeks that she was, you know, missing. Well, I'm glad that she's been returned and that's trauma. You know, that's something she's gonna have to work, really work through. Um, interestingly enough, trauma, if you don't work through it, um, it's, it's something that you put yourself back in that same position because it's familiar, even though it's not what you like, it's familiar. Um, and, and I think maybe next time, because I definitely want to have this group on again to talk some more. I think that we could definitely go deeper and talk on um, different layers of this. But looking at it from the psychological um, perspective, it's what, where's your mindset? Um, and, and how to keep your mindset uh, so that you're less likely to uh, get pulled back into a situation that you've already been in. Uh, but this also affects the entire family because now you have the parents that are afraid to leave you know, their kids alone. They're afraid to go to work because they don't want this to happen again. You know, the children or the person that went missing is suffering from PTSD. Um, you know, wondering if someone is around the corner watching them, going to take them again. So it definitely is a lot of work that needs to be done um, to, to address this issue. Well, fantastic. I see that we are coming up on the eight o'clock hour. So we are going to wrap up. Um, I do want to say that uh, I would like to sponsor legislation with you, State's Attorney Aisha Brave Boy. And I, I think that this group right here could be, um, you know, our, our our brain trust to figure out how to actually <laughs> come up with some solutions to the problems that we have. And although we can't solve them all at once, I think we can start chipping at things incrementally um, to make a difference. Uh, with the skill sets that we have right here, I think we can do a whole lot. I'm so I feel so blessed um, that you all blessed us with this information today. Um, it's it's really been incredible. Um, I had a fantastic time. So I, I hope that those out there watching also did as well. Um, I learned a lot as I'm sure that you all did as well. And uh, thank you so much all of you who joined. I wanna thank you again, uh, Derricka Wilson and Natalie Wilson. And for the record, you all are sisters, right? Sister-in-law. Sister-in-laws, oh, that's, okay. that's beautiful. Um, State's Attorney Aisha Brave Boy, thank you. A sister from another mister.
Uh, and Regina Anderson uh, Ford, I want to thank you so much for um, organizing this, uh, getting this group together, and uh, for all the technical work. Demetrius Keller, thank you so much. Hopefully, you'll get on my producer. Um, and uh, and I think we have a couple more people. I definitely want to thank Dr. Lynn Lightfoot. Yeah. <laughs> um, thank you. I, you know, it's you're you're one of those individuals who literally starts life with people. Mm -hmm. You know, you are there at the most vulnerable time for the older person who's actually giving birth, but they mm -hmm. bring somebody new into the world. And it's your loving touch is the first touch that they will feel. And uh, that is meaningful. So you are a blessing. Thank you for, for being that for people. I want to thank Marie's Gibbs, who also goes by an alias, Marie Iwa Bourne. Um, <laughs> and uh, thank her for, for all of her work. She's my legislative aide, and we'll be working closely together to get this legislation uh, put together. Also, I don't believe they're on, but uh, Carla Cash, who's Constituent Services, uh, as well as Hugo Cantu, who's my policy analyst. So thank you again. Um, I think this was this was very helpful in helping us to understand some of the racial disparities um, in health all the way around, certainly in the, in, in the childbirth process, um, access to health care, um, equity in um, equity in, in looking at uh, black and missing, uh, looking at that as an equitable wish issue um, and recognizing the value in the individual that is missing. Uh, but it's up to us to value ourselves so that we go out there to find ourselves. <laughs> Help us find us. I love that. I love it. Thank you so much again. Good night, everyone. Um, stay safe, healthy, and informed. I appreciate you. Thank you. Good night, Thank everybody. You. Good night. Bye-bye. Good night. Thank you. Bye.